so yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's been probably two or three years since I, I spoke here. At, we were probably just getting started with Saviok at that time. Um, so I sort of think of this as a little bit of an update or maybe my current perspective on robotics. Um, as Ken said, I, I've been doing robots for I, about 10 years now. Actually, at IBM and Xerox PARC, I wasn't doing robots as much as human-computer interaction. Um, but I've been interested in this field for a long time. And I'll tell you a little bit today about, first of all, what's a robot? If you want to have fun, go to a robotics conference and ask somebody to define a robot precisely and watch them squirm. It's, not, it's, it's fun. Um, and so I'll tell you what I mean by a robot and the kind of robots I'm going to talk about. And then I'll tell you why I think this is important to create robots for the service industry, um, how we're doing it, um, and in particular, how we're getting funded for it, because I think that's that's interesting uh, piece and, and something that's changed over the last 10 years. And then I'll finally tell you a little bit more about this robot relay and um, and some just give you some little video clips of some other robots just to, for context. So let me start with this thesis, um, and that's that robots on a service team increase productivity. So <coughs> I, I kind of think of this as a new kind of diversity, right? You have diversity among, you know, we always think about gender diversity and ethnicity diversity. Um, and think about um, an agent that has a really different skill set. And adding a robotic agent to a human team actually makes the team more productive. Robots have very different skills. On the empathy scale, um, robots are pretty low. Basically, whatever the designer can pour in, and it's a sort of an approximation of, of human empathy at, at, a, at a base level. Um, from a common sense point of view, in spite of what you hear or may believe about AI, common sense is not one of the things we've solved, and robots are not, don't have a ton of common sense. Um, but what they do is that they're willing to do anything you tell them, so they're willing to do the dirty, dull, and dangerous jobs, and they're willing to, uh, and they'll do it in a way where they'll record everything they do, um, they'll show up for work every day, uh, they'll, be, they'll be very good workers as long as you tell them exactly what to do, right? And so adding them to the team makes the team more productive. Um, I say this up front because, you know, one of the classic objections, and, and there's a meme on the Internet that basically says, oh, that robot's going to take my job, or AI is going to take all of our jobs. And I assume that you don't believe that, because if you believe that all the jobs were going to go away in 20 years, why are you getting an education, right? There's no point, right? So, so um, and I, I don't believe it either, right? I don't believe that all the jobs are going away. I think history kind of belies that. But nevertheless, it's something people worry about. And the right way to think about it is not that technology comes in and just takes over. It's that technology makes us more productive so that we can do more, so that we can create more wealth, so that we can hopefully distribute that wealth so everybody does better. That's my, my utopian view. Um, so speaking of utopian views, there's nothing better than anime. Um, so here is a, a video that was made by, um, we have a, now a Japanese partner, NEC, who's selling our robots in Japan, and so they created this little uh, skit. It's um, very cute, but it's kind of a vision. The girl forgot her bear, and so, uh, oh my god, you know. Uh, and uh, fortunately, relayed to the rescue, um, and you call down and say, uh, can, you, can we bring it? Yay, and everybody's happy. And um, So this is like the extreme utopia, right? Um, bye. And then, of course, uh, She's writing a thank you note. That's you know in Japanese, but um, so I, I point this out. I like to point this video at the beginning because actually this is all true, and I'll show you at the end. You know I've got thank you notes from kids who send stuff to who send thank you notes to us about the robot. Um, before I before I dive into that, so let me let me start with what's a robot. Um, I like to divide up the field of robots this way, for two different axes. It's a I'm not a consultant. I've never been a consultant. But if I were a consultant, this is a two by two, and that's what consultants do. Um, uh, so you can think of robots remote controlled or autonomous. So are they working on their own, or are they directly under the control of people? And there's, this is actually a continuum. And then are they fixed, or are they mobile? Um, and this is mostly true. So robots in, um, well, it's starting, let's start with, uh, this is a factory robot. The, the kind of robots that build your car, or help build your car, right? Car factories are something like 50% automated. Um, and by the way, that's not where all the automotive jobs went, <laughs> right? But the, you, the reason that you want this robot, which is really stupid and blind, right? It's basically just weld, 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 next car, weld, weld, weld. And you have like six of these doing it at a time, and you see sparks flying, and it's, 
It's actually quite amazing to watch it in a, in a factory. The reason that you want the robot welding your car for you is that it's very precise. It does the same thing every time. And so you can rely on your car's welds when you get into a crash or other situations. And this was not always the case. Cars used to be much lower quality. But this robot is autonomous in the sense that it's running a program. It's doing weld, 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 weld over and over again. Um, but it's not smart in any way. It's not adapting to its environment. At most, um, some of the more advanced automotive lines would have here comes a Corolla, I'll weld in these places. Here comes a minivan, Sienna, I'll weld in different places, right? And so, wow, it's smart. It knew which car it was. Well, <laughs> it's just a program, right? Um, another interesting category of fixed robots is this one. This is the um, Da Vinci surgical robot that um, uh, does surgery, but it's completely remote controlled by a surgeon. In fact, not even really remote controlled. The surgeon will be sitting here. The patient will be at the other side of the stage with one of these robots reaching into him. The surgeon's kind of got a hood on to make sure there's no reflections of what he's seeing. Got a place to rest the elbows and um, some very fancy manipulation, which is being transmitted to the robot. So the, the system is basically a power tool for the surgeon. Gives him some really nice advantages. It lets him rest, right? If you're, if you're holding uh, things inside somebody's body and you get a cramp in your hand, it's not good for you or the patient, right? In this case, he can basically just hit the pause button. Everything holds still. He can shake out his hand and then continue, right? So um, this is a, you know, an, an important class of robots, I think. But again, no, no autonomy, and it doesn't really move around except within the patient. Um, mobile robots that are remote controlled, a classic in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, created to, to dispose of bombs along the side of the road primarily. Um, and so this is one that typically will have, you can't see it in the picture, but will typically have a, a fiber optic cable that spools out behind it so that it's not interfered with by radio even. And it's just drive a quarter mile down the road and then somebody looks through the cameras and you know, manipulates the thing and tries to either explode it or move it out of the way or whatever that they're trying to do. Um, and then the class of robots that I'm interested in are um, what I call mobile and autonomous. Autonomous mobile robots, which can be either indoor or outdoor. Um, so that's the category that I think are interesting. But when I say autonomous and mobile, now you have to talk about where, right? Because um, if I take that car and I try to put it into this environment, it doesn't work, right? So you realize immediately we engineer our environments um, to make ourselves more productive, to make our tools work better. We put roads in to make our cars work better. Um, sometimes, you know, infrastructure takes a while to keep up, try to drive around San Francisco, at the wrong time of day, it can be challenging. Um, but at least you don't have this situation. If you had this situation, it will take a lot longer to get from one place to another in a car. Um, so roads obviously makes a big difference. Sidewalks is what we've done for ourselves and for those of us who are in uh, wheelchairs. So we create um, smoother environments that make it easier for us to walk and easier for us to roll down the street. Um, but they can have challenges. Um, and so uh, there's robots that are designed to go on sidewalks, but they have to be programmed to go around these instances, and they have to basically be updated regularly to know literally where the potholes are. Um, and then in our buildings, they tend to be really nice and smooth. Even this building, which has this nice uh, drop-off here that robots wouldn't do very well with, um, has this nice ramp around the edge that's mandated by the Americans with Disabilities Act so that uh, if I had my robot here, it would basically drive around here and, and come out and I didn't bring it today, sorry. Um, this works great, although there are still buildings, and in particular homes, that have what I call gratuitous stairs, right? It's, it's a really nice to have a sunken living room, and thank you very much, my robot can't go there. Um, uh, so, so our focus is, again, mobile robots, indoors, uh, areas where you don't have to go downstairs or upstairs. Um, now, there's a lot of places like that in the world. This is actually going back to Willow Garage, and I want to talk about why do we want service robots. Um, this is the PR2 robot, and doing uh, a very, you know, probably the most important task in robotics, which is bring me a beer. Um, uh, and you see it, it was able to be programmed to open up the refrigerator, reach in, pick a beer. There was like a little bit of computer vision going on when we did this. Pick the right kind of beer. Um, if you asked it for Guinness, it would bring you a Guinness. If you asked it for Bud Light, it was, had some AI, it would say, are you sure you want a Bud Light? Um, and then um, make sure you close the door and, and uh, 
uh, and then navigate to a person and then deliver that beer. So the interesting thing about this was this was done, this application on top of the robot and the robot operating system was done in a week. So uh, it wasn't used very much, to be honest, but it was, you know, the demonstration was done in a week by about eight people. So it was a, it was a crash course by people who were up to speed in the technology. Um, this part wasn't the most robust part, um, but, you know, a really important, helpful thing to do is to open that beer um, and make a mess in the lab. Um, this is actually an example that was done here at uh, Berkeley. Um, and um, early on with a very early version, you could see that the head isn't even finished on the robot. But um, the idea was to try to fold towels. Um, and this project um, demonstrated a couple things. One, it really got people's attention. When this came out, and this was now probably eight years ago, um, this little thing right there, uh, you know, really got a lot of hits on YouTube, a lot of interest. This idea that, wow, I can just grab from a random pile of towels and fold it and bring it. Great idea. The, the reality here was um, in the first version, it took 25 minutes per towel, which means that although it's cool, you're not going to field it, right? And that robot was, we sold it um, at Willow Garage mainly to research institutions. We gave some away and then we sold some. But the price tag was like $400,000 list. So nobody was actually buying it to bring them beers. Even really rich people weren't buying it to buy, bring them beers. Well, one guy in the Mideast. <laughs> um, but this is the, this kind of the crux of, of why I'm interested in, in, in robots. Um, and this is a guy named Henry Evans who saw that PR2 robot, the one I just showed you, on CNN one day and said, that robot could be my external body. Henry used to be a CFO of a company in Palo Alto. Um, and had a brainstem stroke, and suddenly one day at about age 40, isn't able to speak anymore. He's basically locked in. And if you think about locked in syndrome, it's a horrible thing. Um, he was able to get his head moving enough that he can do head tracking, um, and so he can type and he can communicate a little bit, letter by letter. And, um, but he saw that robot on CNN and he said, can I try that to be my external body? Which is a really cool idea. And so, he, so we said, yeah, let's try it. We created an interface. And what he did, he s took the robot and he turned it on himself and he started bringing the hand toward his head and we we're holding onto the run stop like, what is he going to do? And he reached out and scratched his itch. The first time in 10 years he scratched his own itch and there wasn't a dry eye in the room, I can tell you. It was just this amazing thing because he didn't let us know he was going to try that. Um, but he also wanted to shave himself and, um, and we tried lots of different experiments. We did this work uh, primarily with Georgia Tech students um, who created this interface and then um, came out to visit Henry and try out various things. We, we measured, there's a force torque sensor for those of you in robotics on the, sort of on the hand here. And so we knew when we tested his wife shaving him and him shaving himself that he pushed 10 times harder than she did. So you can understand why he wanted to shave himself. Um, here he's using some pretty advanced software that we were developing to basically be able to remotely open a drawer from another room. Turns out to be surprisingly hard to remotely control a robot, but not impossible, and a really interesting uh, opportunity. One of the spin-offs from Willow Garage, that early spin-offs that came sort of inspired by this effort was the Beam, the remote presence robot that allows you to basically drive around another location and talk to people. This is the extreme of that. Henry could move the robot around his house, open a t this is actually him opening a drawer in his kitchen, and then it drove back and used the towel to, to wipe his own face. This is the kind of dignity that, um, that, you know, th that robots can provide. And so to me, this is a, a big reason why we do, why we want to do robotics. Um, and just for fun, th this is a project that was done at Penn um, based on that inspiration of Henry scratching his own itch to try to build a, a robot that could mount on the table that he always has over his bed um, it's a little bit uh, janky. <laughs> it's a long carbon fiber tubes to try to make the, the physics work out, and it's still a little bit shaky. It's built with servo motors. But what's cool is Henry actually uses this, or has used it for about three or four years now, as the way he scratches his itch, because this one is actually affordable, right? So you can see him, you know, reaching over, and he basically, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's not the best robot you can imagine. It's just something that allows him to figure out how to scratch his head. Um, and just get me something that's close to my head so I can scratch it. Um, 
I'm smiling. So, all right, let me talk a little bit about what's going on on the business side of robotics because I think it's interesting. Um, so I told you why we want to do robots and, and kind of what robots I'm interested in. Um, this is a really interesting stat. A lot of this is, um, this was through 2016, um, and for a long time, as you can see, it was really hard to get your robotics company funded. And that's changed in the last couple of years, um, and maybe the last three or four years. And, and what changed, I, I kind of try to answer the question, well, why is this? Why do, why was suddenly are people funding robotics? Um, and I, I came up with three good, three reasons. One is there's been some successful exits. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg, but once VCs see uh, exits in robotics companies, once they see that there's money to be made, then they're willing to invest. And some of these are big numbers. Um, 680 million, uh, Kiva was acquired by Amazon for almost 800 million. Um, some of these things are even, even larger robotics companies getting acquired. And so it seems like there's a business there, which means that there's one reason people are interested. Another reason is that um, businesses need robotics, right? And the way I think about this is, you know, if you look at service industries in general, you've got, um, you've got costs growing and the industries aren't growing as fast as the costs are growing. And so you get a squeeze point. And for people in the service industry, this is terrible. They say, you know, I'm all about service. I'm in the service. I work at a hotel because I like to make people happy. I like to provide hospitality. And when they're forced to cut services, if you're running a hotel, um, it just feels bad. Right? It's not what you want to be doing. And so you have to have productivity keep up with your costs. Your costs are driven by healthcare because mostly services are provided by people. So in order to let people continue to make more money and be able to provide health care and so forth, you've got to have those people be more productive. And we tried computers, right? We have now computers at every front desk. You don't have a sign-in book anymore in hotels. Um, we're trying, the hotels are currently trying cell phones. So the fact that every person on the staff can be reached at any given time, you can send them things, you can have workflow systems running with your smartphone, that's great. Those are productivity increases. But robots will be the next one of those. Um, and so, so businesses need them. Um, and finally, uh, we can do this, right? So on a technology side, we actually crossed a point. I argue it was about 12 years ago, you know, plus or minus. But this blue line is Moore's Law, right? And as Moore's Law went up, even though it's, it's kind of tapping out, right? Moore's Law is a computing for the same dollars doubles every 18 months. Even though we're kind of hitting the end of that, fortunately, we hit it above this red line. And the red line represents how much computing power you need to be able to interpret the sensors on a robot and make decisions in real time. Because if you think about it, if I'm walking across the stage and something jumps in front of me, and I detect that it jumped in front of me about now, even though it was back there, um, it's not very helpful, right? I have to be able to process faster than real time. I have to be able to see objects, see problems before they occur. And all of us have this ability. We all move through the world at least a little bit predicting the future. You know, as we drive down the road, we predict what that car is going to do and we anticipate um, as we walk through an airport, we avoid the other people in, in a pretty natural and, and way that we don't even think about. Um, and, I, and I joke because this is great. This is now robots can, can move around through the world and do things safely. Um, nobody bothers to write on their resume uh, I can walk down the hall without bumping into things, right? It's like, it's not a line that you bother to write on your resume. So it's such a fundamental skill. It's such a low-level task. And yet, finally, robots can do that. So if you're worried that robots are taking over the world, you've got a long way to go. Um, the other two big reasons, um, sensors have gotten a lot cheaper, which means that not only do you have the compute power to handle the sensors, but you can afford to put sensors on mobile platforms. This has really been driven a lot by... Um, Video games, the, the Kinect was the first one. And then more recently, the, all the sensing platforms for drones and sense, lightweight, low power sensing and computation platform for drones, which is a big market. So a lot of people invested in that. Um, and finally, last but not least, the robot operating system that we developed at Willow Garage is really the Linux of robotics and has created um, a platform. You know, we use it in Savvy Oak. Um, there's probably a dozen startups around the Bay Area that are founded by Willow Garage alumni and using the robot operating system as their basis. Um, and I would say most universities um, around the world are actually using ROS at this point. So it really does, the openness, the fact that there's no commercial value there. So it sounds like I'm giving you an ad for ROS, but you know, I, I make no money from this. Um, 
is a, uh, just the fact that we've created this open source thing and given to the world lets the world go faster. Um, let me just say briefly um, what I think the challenges are. So I make it sound like, oh, robots is here and they're coming and everything. Um, but our biggest challenge is inflated expectations. <laughs> if you tell somebody, I've got a robot, and I've done this many times, they'll say, oh, I need a robot. You know, if they're a kid, they'll say, can you have it do my homework? Well, no, but, and, and even if I could, I wouldn't, right? Um, can you have it do the dishes? I said, well, don't you have a dishwasher? Yeah, yeah, but I want you to do all the other stuff. That's the hard stuff. Um, I want you to do my laundry, right? I want it to clean my house. The hard tasks that we don't, nobody in robotics knows how to do yet reliably. So the expectations are very high. Um, on the other hand, the use cases that match what we can do, what we should do, um, and what we can do at an affordable price, those are actually kind of tricky to find. It's, it's hard to go out and, and, and it requires um, social science skills, it requires ethnography to really go out and understand why, you know, what are people doing in the world, what's the real problem they're trying to solve, how can we create technology to make them more productive, how can we help, right, is the way I like to think about it. Um, manipulation, uh, in other words, putting an arm on a mobile robot, because I kind of divided those two things out, but you can put it like the PR2 had an arm on a mobile robot, but solving that problem in a general way is actually pretty challenging. Walking up, uh, I, I did an example at Willow Garage, I should have brought the video. Um, I, I challenged the team, actually I challenged the worldwide team of people with PR2 robots, uh, what I called the sushi challenge, okay? So it's really simple. There's a table in a room, and I want you to clear the table, the robot should clear the table, and then it should go over to the sideboard and get the uh, dishes and set the table, right? And, and then, just for fun, we had a, a rotating uh, tray which had sushi, uh, not real sushi, but just sushi plates on it, and you were supposed to grab one of those and serve it on the table, okay? That was the problem. It's, it seems relatively straightforward, right? If you want to do a restaurant application, this seems like, you know, basic thing. This was so hard. First thing that the researchers and programmers around the world said was, okay, but can you get rid of all the chairs, please? <laughs> because it's actually hard for the robot to navigate up to the table with all those chairs in the way, and the PR2 robot wasn't able to actually move the chairs, or we could design chairs that could be easily rolled away by a robot that could only move, you know, five pounds with its arms. Um, you know, not the problem that you thought of, you know, when I told the problem, that, when I sort of posed the problem, it's not the first thing you think of. Then they said, okay, now all the plates and everything that's on the table, can we have an exact 3D model of all those, please? Well, it's not really realistic. I mean, any one of you in the room could clear that table in probably 30 seconds um, and then set the table in another 30 seconds um, and you could probably pick things off that table. Um, then we tried it using the remote control tools, the kind of things I showed you with Henry Evans, um, where somebody's remotely controlling the robot and let's say that they can do it. It's, it's a little bit clunky to control that robot, but they were able to clear that table and set the table and in about 10 minutes, and it took another five minutes to try to grab something off that rotating thing because timing, you know, the, the way the arms move was like kind of, you know, very slow and so you'd have to really time it to grab it. Um, eventually, uh, software people were, and roboticists were able to solve this whole thing um, with no chairs, with models of all the plates, with a bunch of simplifying assumptions. Um, and interestingly, the easiest part was getting that stuff off the rotating table. Because once you model that, it's going at a constant speed, and you know how fast the arm moves, that's just, a, an, uh, you know, that's just like filling in parameters and you can just grab it. That's the easy part. Picking up chopsticks off the table, that was really hard because they were flat and the robot couldn't really see them. And when we actually tried this at one of the big robotics conferences, it was a room with a skylight with kind of um, bars across it, and it put a nice bars on the table, the shadows, and the robots were just like <laughs> going after all these shadows. Um, it was pretty nasty. Um, coming up with a business model is challenging. So wh what we do at Savvy Oak, we went in and said, I said, I'm not going to sell robots. I'm going to sell a delivery service. Why? Because if I'm going to put robots in hotels or in other businesses, I'm pretty sure that they don't have a chief robotics officer, right? And I've been through the entire PC revolution. I remember when we first got PCs, and then you, everybody had to go find a high school student who kind of knew them and hire that person to kind of do things and it wasn't very satisfactory. And now, something like 10% of the uh, budgets of like the Fortune 500 companies are for IT, 
right? We're spending a lot of money on IT. We've got CIOs as a new position that didn't used to exist because we have computers. I didn't want there to be a chief robot officer, and so I said, well, let's, let's take that off. Let's take that on what we do and, and jump ahead a little bit because what you see is that you know, more and more we offer things as a service as opposed to having you buy them, right? How many people still buy CDs? Right? You, you get Spotify, right? You get it, music as a service. Even though you used to be able to buy things, you used to buy records, the world's changing, and so we kind of try to jump ahead with that. I don't know whether it works yet. Um, I mean, it's working for us so far, but we're not profitable yet, so it's so <laughs> another step. But coming up with the right business model is challenging, and you have to be creative. And for all of you who are out there studying robotics, good job. Give me a call. Um, there is a very serious uh, shortage in robotics people, and people with robotics and AI skills generally are in huge demand right now. Um, what we tried to solve, I'll show you Relay and I'll show you more of it in a minute. Um, it's a, I, PR2 was a very complicated robot. It was 32 motors, um, head could move, all kinds of stuff could move. Relay is at the other end of the spectrum. It's probably the simplest robot you can imagine, almost the simplest. Um, what we tried to go after was this problem of how do you put a robot out in the world 24-7? How many people in the room have built robots or created robots before? A few. Um, how many of you have left those robots unattended for like two weeks somewhere where you're not, nobody from your team is? Right? A couple. Yeah, it's, it's, it's rare, right? And it's a really scary, challenging thing. We left our robots in hotels among the general public. Um, and we had no idea whether, you know, drunk people were going to tear them limb from limb. We still haven't been brave enough to go into Las Vegas uh, where they may. Um, but uh, this is what um, we ended up creating that, that is, does go out into the world 24-7. So here's a, um, kind of the full example. Somebody calls the front desk and says, hey, can you send up some snacks? Um, this is the front desk agent. He basically puts it in, types in the room number, and says go. And now the robot navigates completely autonomously, calls the elevator, rides the elevator, gets out of the elevator, and then goes up to the room, calls the room when it gets there. So how did it let you know? Um, person in the room gets excited. Now, I have to say, this kid's an actor, and you can tell. Um, uh, gets all excited, takes the stuff out, um, and then sends the robot back, and the robot navigates back through the lobby and back to its dock. So we've been doing this. We're now in, uh, we've sold over 100 of these. Um, so they're in a bunch of different buildings. Uh, that was also staged, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but the reason I point out that it's staged is because I'm going to show you a video in a minute that was taken by a dad. That's actually, you know, this is real. So that, you know, the, we can we kind of reenact these things for marketing purposes. Um, but uh, but it's interesting. So I want to just jump back, and I, I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, but I want to make sure I talk about this. We started this company four years ago. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of money. We said, how can we get robots out there as fast as possible to answer questions like, are people going to destroy the robots? Are people going to accept the robots? Are, is anybody going to buy these things, right? You can't just go build a whole you know, four-year program and then roll out the product. Um, and so we actually, this trash can wasn't part of it. Um, <laughs> but these other ones were actually prototypes that we had in the lab in, in, you know, in the first few months that we were around. Um, we got to this one, and there was a tablet that went here, a computer in the bottom, and this robot was working. Like, it would actually navigate autonomously, but you can see it's just a frame, and it's not really something you could show in a hotel. And so I said, can we just, like, put spandex over it or something so that we can take it out to the hotel? And so we did, and it looked absolutely horrible. Um, and so we got rid of the spandex, um, and we took the time to 3D print lots of panels and glue them on. Um, and then we found a really amazing prototyping trick, which you're all welcome to use, which is after you finish 3D printing all the panels and creating your robot, take it to an auto body shop and ask them to make it nice. They'll bondo it, they'll sand it, they'll put on really shiny car paint, and when it's finished, it'll look amazing. Um, and, and that's actually what we raised a couple million dollars with in our you know, five months after we started the company. Um, so just to, as I told you that it was real, um, this is a, a, a real video from a cell phone, obviously. Um, so this is not an actor, actress. Look, it's Molly. Oh my God, it's Molly! Oh my God. 
It says hello. <laughs> move your delivery, it says. Move your delivery. Wally, the butler. Wow. Okay, get it out, Julie. What is that? And when you're done, it says hit all set the green button, Julia. It's all empty. How was your say? Give him some give him four five stars. Five stars. Oh. Five stars. Oh. Yay. He says yay. Thank you. I think Do you want anything else? Anything else? And it's just so No. Like anything else? Okay, I'm getting okay, home. Oh my god. Oh, 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 oh my god. Oh my god. Heading home. So so there's a lot packed into this. Um, uh, experience. Oh my God, there he goes. Look, there he goes. Oh, she chased down. So that th you can see that there's empathy, right? But but the empathy is not the robots, right? She can say thank you, Wally. Wally doesn't care what she says, right? <laughs> she can say something else to you, Wally. Right? Um, So that, so the empathy is generated by the design. I should how do I pause it? Yeah, the empathy is generated by the design of the robot. The robot doesn't itself have empathy. It's hard for people to tell, right? People will always imbue. You know, they'll think, "Oh, that car um, is cute." Well, it's cute because of design, right? That car saw me and went around me. No, it saw you and went around you because of the driver. Or eventually, in self-driving cars, because it was programmed to not hit anything, right? We, we use a really cool trick in robotics, which is um, there's a flat ground, and then there's stuff above the flat ground. So you can drive on flat ground, and if there's any stuff, you should avoid it. That's a like, really simple rule. Um, and, and it works pretty well. And if you, if you move gracefully within those constraints, you get a lot of results. Um, and, and you generate a connection with people. Um, we actually have a lot of these letters where people, Dear Winnie, you know, this was from Australia. Um, <coughs> Uh, you have to read carefully. I love your sense of humor, which I think is hilarious because it doesn't have a sense of humor, really. Um, <laughs> and it's great that you have lovely manners. Uh, okay. It's nice that it comes across that way. Um, so I won't say a lot. We're actually moving beyond hotels. Um, we're, we're continuing to, to deploy in hotels, but we're looking at other use cases. Here's a, another classic anime of uh, robots. Um, you know, I've got snacks for everyone. Yay, everyone's happy. Um, again, uh, I, I love the way that anime kind of gets at the, the emotions and what you want to do. Enjoy the treats, yay. Um, but those are actually the sounds that the robot makes, and everyone loves Relay. Um, so um, there's other robots going on in hotels. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time, but there's a hotel in Japan that has these guys at the front desk. Please say your name in full, he says. Thank you for your visitors coming from a dinosaur. Sounds like he ate them. Um, interestingly, most of you in this room have to choose the dinosaur because the woman always speaks Japanese. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Um, it seems like if it's a program, either one could do it. Um, and just for fun, just some robots that I saw recently at a conference of various kinds. This one is the most unexpected. It's, it's a version of this robot out of Germany called the Carolbot. It has the most unexpected motion. Um, you'll see in a minute it starts to move. And, and you kind of have to ask why, and I don't have an answer for that. Um, but, but I thought it was really cool that it was doing that. Um, and then the most unexpected robots I've seen recently that I'll leave you with, and we'll go to questions, um, are these <laughs> actually fish robots. Um, they weren't cheap enough that I would buy them from my swimming pool at home, but I almost did. I almost splurged. Anyway, uh, with that, let me let me thank you and take questions. Yeah. One back here. Hi, thank you for the uh, presentation. I have a question: How the robots uh, integrated with the elevator system in the building? Ah, good. So um, what we've done is is we build an interface to the elevator, and then the robot speaks to it over Wi-Fi or LTE. 
So we basically put the elevator system buttons on the network. And that's actually a lot of work. It's not very interesting work, but it's, it's a lot of work and requires us to integrate with all the different elevator companies. Um, um, it ends up being one of, the, one of the challenges about this whole model for now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you're a big proponent of cloud robotics. And I wanted to, I remember your famous quote of uh, no robot is an island. And I'm curious what to be cloud robotics is part of this, uh, part of the, the, the design of the company. And, and, and in some sense, we're thinking of how that may have changed in the last couple of years, especially with uh, learning remote cultures, with remote data centers. Yeah, so. Um, so we've always had, and one of the things that uh, we realized at Willow Garage was that having a person in the loop makes a robot more powerful. And I, and I, I kind of alluded to it at the beginning. You add a robot to a team, the, the team member is responsible for providing the common sense. Um, we actually have um, two lever levels of help for our robots. One of them is uh, a cloud monitoring system. So, so the robots, there's a system in the cloud that's monitoring the robot, making sure everything's okay noticing if there's any kind of anomaly. So if somebody would pick up the robot and start carrying it out to their pickup truck, the robot would detect it and, and raise an alarm. And then the question is, well, who gets the alarm? For us, the alarm goes to a call center. So it's a call center that we run, but it's mostly called by robots or by the cloud service. Um, and then that call center can take appropriate action, which will either get the robot out of trouble. Most of the time it can do it on the, the person in the call center can do that on their own. So they're helping the robot out. So you could think of that person as a, the robots in the fleet are a force multiplier for that person to do lots of deliveries. And then what they can also do is call the front desk staff so that somebody on, whose job it is to get that delivery to happen, who's really the one that the robot's helping out. So we, we use people in, in interesting ways. And we try to you know, continue to improve the autonomy, do as much as we can in the cloud, train an AI. One of the things we've done recently is, is taught the robot using all the data we've collected how to know when it's on a particular floor. Um, so that we don't have to wait for the Wi-Fi to reconnect when we get when the doors open. It's a lot of times not in all buildings, but in a lot of buildings you lose connection with the elevator. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things that we found kind of the corner cases that we solve with AI and with cloud robotics. Yeah. Um, and you're right, the ro robots aren't an island. We don't sell you a robot because it, it would work okay. Like if I if I had a robot here, I could make it work. But when you put a robot out with somebody else, it's part of a system and it's a service that we provide. Um, you right here. You spoke about um, robots being created for social needs, and um, there's researchers out to ensure that robots are created for those needs. Um, so you know, we work for a nonprofit, and we provide a youth programming um, in East Oakland. And um, right now, we want to know how are you able to get um, robotics in the classes. Um, of some of these students, which is a you know a huge social need because you know these are a lot of the jobs that they're going to be doing within you know when they graduate, and this is what's going to be offered for them, especially in the Bay Area, to even keep them in the Bay Area. So what's what's the plan to ensure that these students are getting um, the robotics exposures that they need? Um, that's a good question, I, and I think a lot about um, how do we get. How do we educate people? And, and the world's changing fast, not just because of what we're doing, but because of what everything that's happening. The world's changing fast. And we have to think about how do we educate people to use the technology. The first answer I would give is um, we design the technology to be so easy to use that if you have a high school education, you should be able to, to have it on your team and work with it. So there's no real need to have the robot come into the classroom. Um, now, for a different reason, um, you want to create robots that people can you know, become roboticists, right? So you can learn how to, how to do the next level deeper, how you can design these things, how you can build solutions. And that's a different skill set. That's probably not this robot. This robot's designed for a very specific task. But the PR2, for example, that, that Ken has, um, you know, we, we created those and gave them away to the top universities. Uh, they were too expensive to give away at the high school level, but we gave them away to some universities, and other universities wrote grants and bought them. Um, it wasn't, that wasn't a for-profit program. That was just let's get robots in the hands of people that they can use and share. Um, but the, the output of that was that this robot operating system gets created, and that is something that can be used in a high school classroom. 
And so that becomes the interesting uh, next step. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very hot, right? It's not, it's not something that we've done, uh, that I've done personally, but uh, drones and, and uh, unmanned vehicles in the air are something that w art's going to change. They're already changing pieces of society, some good, some bad, right? I mean, uh, you have open questions about um, using them to you know, bomb people in, <laughs> in other countries from a long way away. On the other hand, you have them delivering drugs in Africa. Right where you, where there are no roads or where it would be hard to get things, um, you have them completely changing the way that um, movies are made. Right, they just open up new shots. So, again, when you when you look at a technology like that and you say, what are the use cases? What's really stunning over the last ten or fifteen years is that we went from helicopters being really really hard to fly, and it was a, a tour de force out of Stanford, um, with actually a Berkeley undergrad who went to Stanford who was one of the first people to show that they could fly a, a helicopter um, autonomously. You know, um, and then we realized, oh, well, if you, instead of having one rotor, you have four, that's actually an easier control problem. And once that was solved, and again, Moore's Law helps us because you can get cheap computing that can solve that control problem. Suddenly, yeah, you can say things like fly from here to there, and as long as you've got enough, you know, now the problem becomes battery. A lot of these robotics problems come back to physics. You start solving, you've like figured out how to do some of the AI stuff, and then the problem comes back around to physics. How do you deal with failures? <clears throat> with failures? Mm -hmm. So so we... What, what, you, oh. All your system is based on, on Wi-Fi or some... Right. So what if that breaks? What do you so, do? Um, so what we, we have uh, multiple layers for any, any given failure. So... Um, one thing we do every week is that we look at how many deliveries. We tip, right now, we do about 3,000 deliveries a week. We'll have one to 200 failures of various kinds. Okay. Some number of those failures will be false positives. We'll just recognize those. Some of those will be handled by the call center. And some of those are deeper problems. And we look at the deeper problems, and we say, now let's build some new technology to solve the frequent and important problems. Are these deeper problems? Because of sensing or computation or actuation, it can be any of those. I mean, a, a good example was the one I was alluding to, where you know, in the first few hotels we were in, we we had good Wi-Fi coverage, actually LTE coverage. So w the robot always was in contact with the elevator controller. So we built our algorithms assuming good connections, and then when that assumption breaks, it doesn't work anymore. And so what we tend to do is push more and more autonomy into the robot where we can. In that case, we added sensors so that the robot knows when it gets to the seventh floor, independent of whether it heard from the elevator controller, and then it can perform better. Mm -hmm. yes. you yeah. Yeah. Right. There's there's lots of ways to do this, right? What what we know is that um, from a lot of studies in social science over the last you know 20 years or more, um, that people are going to personify. They're going to impute uh, emotions. They're going to impute goals and things to to technology, whether it deserves it or not. And so we chose to give a little bit of a nod to that by putting eyes on it that blink. And using a little, a few, some techniques from animation to make it a little bit alive, right? We didn't try to make it human. We're not trying to solve the, you know, we're not trying to cross the gap um, and and deal with um, uncanny valley. We don't want to get close to that. But you know, empirically, we found that if we make it well designed and cute, people react well to it. Um, and when people react well to it, 
it actually has a better chance of being successful at its core task, which is, in our case, delivery. So you mentioned that there was a great shortage of trained roboticists. So what types of skills are you looking for now? How do you see is that changing? And how can we best educate people for these positions that exist now and will exist in the future? Um, so I, I would say the, the cool thing about robotics is that you need the whole stack. So you start with you know, mechanical engineering, um, you have electrical engineering, you have layers of software, you have human-robot interaction, um, you have business on top of that, and then you have systems engineering that's kind of going through and how does this robot fit into the world. All kinds of engineering are important here, right? But it's just a question of, of you know, for a given robotics company, what are they trying to solve at the time? Bread and butter for us is people with classic robotics education um, because they learn to think about things in a certain way. They, they tend to think about things by reducing them to um, mathematical models, which you can then reason about and, and implement over time. That works well. But that's not the only people we hire, right? And mechanical engineers worry about fundamental things like, um, you know, is this thing going to tip over? Is it going to hurt somebody? Is it going to pinch somebody? Those are really, really important things. And I think one of the cool things in robotics is that as a software person, like I am, coming in, you start to realize that, although I never had to worry about my software you know, taking somebody's finger off, um, in robotics you do, right? And you have to really start thinking about safety and thinking about um, all different aspects. And when you put together that team, it's really exciting and fun, but a whole range of skill sets are required. Um, so I'm interested in hearing more about your process of identifying need, specifically how you work with employers or um, consumers or the employees who are going to be affected by these robots, at what stage that may or may not happen. Uh -huh. um, so what we did originally, um, and you know, we started, we had a need finding effort at Willow Garage, and we, we aimed it at the home, for starters, because we thought, we don't really want to be in the factories, um, and homes are pretty underserved except for Roomba by Robotics. Roomba, by the way, is interesting. It's a great design choice because it's this big and there's no way it can fall over, so the mechanical is relatively easy. Um, but we went into homes and we said, what do you want? And we did a whole bunch of studies and we started to realize that what people really want in homes for robotics of the kind that we would build was going to be way too expensive for us to deliver. We, we weren't going to be able to make that market. And then we had this aha moment where we said, you know, there's repeated homes in places like nursing homes, right? Hospitals where lots of people sleep, hotels where people's home away from home. So that kind of homes and, and high-rise apartments kind of fits in that category too. And when you look at those cases, you realize, ah, there's something, uh, there's an opportunity here to do things for a bunch of people instead of doing things one time. Um, so that's, but our need finding is, you know, the process is we, we have an in inkling of a need and then we go out with either prototype or first with just you know notebooks and cameras and go out and just understand what's needed, um, and then do the task analysis. Say you know is it how how necessary is it? So there's this dance of the necessary and possible that Mark Steffick used to talk about. Can I do it? What can I do? What do I need to do? And you kind of go through a double helix of that until you find something that you know we can uniquely provide that the market actually needs, and then you try to convince funders of that. <laughs> it's a startup model. Uh, yes. One, one more question. It's a, yeah, it's a nice application here. Uh, how much does it cost? Um, so we we put these again. As we don't sell the robots, so we put them into service for a monthly fee. Um, that uh, varies, but a typical monthly fee might be like two thousand dollars a month. Um, so you you hire the robot. It's twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, providing this service. So in hotels, that's a typical. Okay, we are out of time. You, we want to come up and ask the question afterward, but let's, uh, let's thank Steve. Thank you so okay. much for coming back. Thank you. Great talk, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>